stick and stick. Okay, so like I said, I'll feed you, but why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself. Um, you can just say your name if you want, if you're comfortable talking about your past okay. or about your skate or whatever, whatever you want. I'll feed you. Okay. I'm Bridie Farrell. I'm from Saratoga Springs, New York, and I currently live in Brooklyn. I'm Bridie Farrell. I grew up in Saratoga Springs, New York, and I currently live in Brooklyn. Okay. So tell me just a little bit about your childhood and your childhood dream. What I'm getting at is the way you grew up mm -hmm. and why you started dreaming about skating or how you started. Right. I grew up in Saratoga Springs, New York, which was, which is a hub for speed skating. And primarily because of our coach that's in Saratoga, his name is Pat Maxwell, is by far the best coach in the U.S. and potentially around the world. So a lot of skaters would relocate to Saratoga Springs. I just happened to be lucky enough to grow up there. So I grew up speed skating, and over time I was doing well within my club and then within my town and state and et cetera, and you just kind of move up the rankings. And I'd say when I was about 12 years old, it's probably the first time where I thought that I could go to the Olympics, and that was my my dream, to go to the Olympics. I started training full-time in the eighth grade. So by full-time, I mean I would go to the gym before school, take a shower at the gym, get ready at the gym, and then my coach would actually drop me off at junior high. And then after school, I would come home, do my homework, and then go to the rink for, I don't know, three or four hours in the evening for training and go to bed and do it all over again the next day. When I was the summer between ninth grade and 10th grade, Andy Gable, who was the number one speed skater in the country at the time, relocated to Saratoga Springs to train with our coach. And I immediately, I mean, I, I remember the first time I met him in 1994 and I knew his stats. I knew he had an Olympic medal. I knew his best friends were the top speed skaters in the country and uh, he, took an interest in me in terms of helping me with my skating, in terms of helping me get to and from practice. And um, eventually that relationship turned into a sexual abuse relationship. Should I keep going? Keep going. Okay. So uh, I, I'm one of six kids. And uh, at one point my mom said if I wanted to go to the rink at five in the morning, then I would have to find a ride. And Andy Gable became that ride to the rink. The way it all started was we would train in the park in the summer and Andy would drive me and my childhood friend home from training. We always dropped her off first. We go to the end of drop her off, back out, go to the end of the street, take a right, and then you'd get to my house. And it was like that every single day. We'd drop off her, back out, take a right at the end of the street, and then dropped me off. And one day after we dropped off Sarah, we got to the end of the street. Instead of, instead of making a right towards my house, we he made a left and he went down a few blocks and turned into a dead end and he pulled the car over and he turned the car off and he looked over at me and he asked me, he said, can I kiss you? And I froze. I said absolutely nothing. And that's when the relationship turned into a mentor to someone that really began to have complete control over me. I didn't say no at the time because what was I going to do? Get out of the car and walk home? And then my parents asked me why I'm walking home and are they going to believe me? Worst case, they don't believe me. Worst case, they do believe me, and then I can't go to skating. So saying yes or saying no never crossed my mind. It was, I just remember freezing. And so I think once Andy realized that he could push the boundary a little farther and a little farther and 
the farther he got, the harder it was for me to say no. And um, then it just turned into seeing him every day, whether it was he would take me out for lunch or dinner. Um, he gave me gifts. He, I mean, now that I'm older and I have done a lot of research about how this works and the whole grooming process and becoming friends with the family and all of that gaining the trust, he was pretty textbook about it. Okay, can you explain the power dynamic and who he was at the time and what that meant to you? Because mm -hmm. I know in a lot of situations like that, young athletes, yeah. they get a mentor. Right. They're a powerful position, Olympic gold medalist, silver medalist, whatever. Explain being 15 years old, having him there, and what that means. Right. I remember being 12 or 13, and Andy Gable came to the rink to practice before the um, 94 Olympic trials. And I remember meeting him and just being in awe. He came and Amy Peterson came and thinking the Derek Jeters of the sport or the Michael Jordans, the, the people that we want to be walked into the rink and I got to skate on the same sheet of ice as them. Their posters were on my wall as a kid kind of thing. So when Andy came back for the 98 Olympic trials and he helped me by getting me to practice and he helped me with my equipment, it wasn't a, a genuine helping. It wasn't as if he was just lending his it wasn't as if he actually cared per se. It was he, I couldn't ever back away from it. And a lot of people say that have never been in the situation say, well, why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you walk away? And even I blame myself for years and years that I have two working feet. Why didn't I walk away? But it's much more than that. The control and the power that someone that is holding your future in their hands, you can't just walk away from that. And we're taught that, well, so, how do I say it? When someone, so the, the power that someone you look up to has, we're starting to see that in a lot of places in society as other folks start to come forward. You can see it in Bill Cosby, that people didn't want to speak up because that was their career on the line. You can see it in the presidential race where people didn't want to speak up against Donald Trump because that was their future. You see it with Megyn Kelly and Fox News. You see it where Kobe Bryant's person she, that he raped came forward, and because it was Kobe Bryant, nobody believed. You see it in Penn State, where you have these massive powers. You see it in the Catholic Church, in Spotlight, the movie. I mean, we have heroes like Phil Saviano that are starting to crack this, but to understand that the power that these people have over someone's dreams and life is, we're starting to be able to have a grasp on that, but at no point did I think I had an option to back out. And I knew going, I knew that it was truly, truly wrong when in the 10th grade I wanted to go to homecoming dance like any 10th grade kid. And I mentioned it to Andy and he let me go once I told him, he told me, that I had to come straight home from the dance, that I couldn't go to an after party, and I had to check in with him when I was home. Well, my parents and my friends and everyone thought it was very admirable of me that I wanted to come home because I got to get up the next morning and train. They didn't know that really there was I was on such a, a leash, and it it speaks to the power and the control that um, he had. And even after Andy stopped speed skating, he went on to be the vice president of US speed skating and ultimately the president of speed skating. In 2000, I was at the world championships 
in Beijing, or uh, sorry, in 2000, I was at the World Championships in Sheffield, England, and he came up to me and he asked if I had told anyone. And I was dating one of the speed skaters on the team, and he, he checked in to see if I had told anyone. And that went on as time went by. So he knew he had that, that power over me. I have spent a fair bit of time pondering what these men could possibly be thinking. When you have an older man, 34 years old, in a sexual relationship with a 15-year-old kid. And... There is a, a part of me that feels sorry for them and Andy in that he must have such a hollow core or hollow sense of self and extreme loneliness that the only way he can be close to a human being is by such intimidation and such control. And I think that Many folks say that people like myself, young teenagers, are very vulnerable. I think that young teenagers like myself are young and not equipped to handle the situation. I think true vulnerability comes from a person choosing to be that. And Andy is too weak of a person to choose vulnerability. I think that the true, like the true signs of someone showing their vulnerability is showing where they hurt and where they need help and also where they're able to love, which I think is um, what we're seeing with a lot of women coming forward and telling their stories, whether however they've been hurt in their lifetime. And so I think that people who systematically over time abuse young people like Andy Gable did have a, an extreme hollowness to them and emptiness to them that I don't know how you correct that. i not justifying what he did or excusing what he did, and I think that anyone who commits a crime to this degree should face legal consequences. But I also think it's important that we recognize the human aspect of the whole story and that there are humans on both sides of this. A lot of sexual abuse is by someone the victim knows. Traditionally, it is someone they know. And Andy helped my skating. Andy helped U.S. speed skating. Andy helped speed skating at large. Andy helped move speed skating forward so that the Apollo Onos could come through, right? Like he did help the sport. But in my mind, in my heart, and in my moral belief, there are some non-negotiable actions. And sexually violating a teenager is one of them. And it is super, super hard for me when I know the person to come forward and say these things, but I think that it is, like I said, a non-negotiable choice he made multiple times over multiple years, and that it's, they should be held accountable and they should be called out. Mm-hmm. And how, well, I'll, I'll get to the next question. Okay. Let's go back to that 15-year-old girl or even before. What what emotionally drove you to do that? Right. And in complete sentence. Right. Uh, 
my so I got into speed skating with my older brother, one of my older brothers. And after a short period of time, my brother Patrick, he said that he didn't want to skate anymore. And so the family and coaches asked him why. And he quite honestly said, what's the point of skating in circles? Which you do have to wonder. I mean, he has a valid point in asking that. But for me, skating was so much more than skating in circles, speed skating. I loved the, I love, love training. And that's both on the ice and off the ice. I love the feeling of utter exhaustion. So at night when you're trying to go to sleep, but you almost can't go to sleep because you're just so exhausted and so tired. Um, I love that feeling of pushing myself to such a degree. And then, oh, let's be honest, I mean, there's nothing cooler than skating super freaking fast in a pack um, with some of your best friends uh, every single day. And um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's like you're living a real live roller coaster, you know, where it's, it's just a combination of such, to me, a combination of such exhilaration and excitement as well as such a, a, a beautiful dance that's taking place. And my younger, one of my younger sisters is a ballerina. And my mom often would come watch our skating practices when we'd skate from say 9.30 to 11 at night when it was just a core group of skaters and she would just watch the skating and enjoy watching the skating because it was so similar to my sister's ballet and the, the pure beauty of it. And the better an athlete is, the easier it looks, which is what we see in the Olympics, that they make it look so effortlessly. Uh, but I love ice skating. I mean, truly, truly love speed skating. And being in a pack with people skating, um, there's a lot of perks I liked. I liked the travel. I liked the friendship. I liked all that. But truly, 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 I loved ice skating, and I loved the – the pressure and intensity surrounding racing. So, I mean, would you say that was your dream and to what extent did Andy take that away from you? So I grew up in Saratoga Springs, which was a, a breeding ground for the USA national speed skating team. From, we had Olympians in the 80s all the way up to I mean, today, right? So we have, it, it, was, it was a place where Olympians came from and national team skaters came from. So the idea of being 12, 13, 14 and saying, I want to go to the Olympics wasn't, or I say it now, it wasn't an extreme statement because it seemed it, that was my norm. Uh, but I... So, I, I mean, I, I really dedicated myself towards going to that quite young. I don't – I dedicated myself going towards that quite young. Um, as far as how – a lot of – many people have asked me, did Andy prevent me from making this team? Did Andy prevent me from this? Or did Andy give me the motivation to do – I got where I am. I got where I got to successfully in speed skating. I had, at one point, three American records. I was on the national team, competed in world championships. I got to, into the college I got to, I got the job I got to, not because of Andy, but despite what happened to me. I'm not gonna say that it didn't impact me. It hugely, 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 immensely impact me, but I also, a lot of people will say everything happens for a reason. I have a hard time believing that, whether it's your God or your Allah or the universe or whatever, said this girl there, we're going to have her be molested by her superhero. Like, you got a bad guy if that's who you're praying to. But I do feel that certain things just happen, and it's, how we deal with that and that possibly it happened to me because I was strong enough to carry it 
forward. And I'd be lying if I said that it happened, I lived my life and then decided to speak about it. I mean, it, it totally uh, put my life into a, a blender and kind of poured it out. At times I felt like it went through a garbage disposal and came out the other end. So it didn't make my life easy, but um, to say everything happens for a reason, I don't believe, but um, whether or not Andy chose the right person, I think he probably thought he was, I mean, I would bet anything that he believed he was home free. It had been 15, 16 years and I never said anything. I'd seen him multiple times. But so in some ways he picked the right person because of who I grew up to be, because of my family that I was part of, because of the, um, dedication I learned in skating, but I grew up to be a person that was able to recognize right from wrong and to stand up and, and speak about it. So how much Andy impacted my skating, we'll never know, but, um, and you, you can't go back and change it. So that was the cards I was dealt and, um, I'm, proud of how I'm handling it 15 years later. So when did you finally say something and who did you say to? And what were the consequences or lack of consequences? Right. So I was molested in 1997 and the beginning of 1998. Before, so that's going into the 10th grade. I did not tell a soul, a single, single person. I wrote about it in my journals, but I never wrote exactly what happened because I thought my parents might find them. I, so you know the, the course in college that you have to take to graduate and you hate and you don't wanna take and ends up changing your life? So I had to take a human development course to graduate from Cornell. And in it, we talked about how adolescent development and adolescent awareness of right and wrong and communication skills and all these things that just take time to develop. And we went through how sexual abuse happens, say, for example, with a 15-year-old and a 30-year-old because the 15-year-old is not equipped, is not wired yet to push that person away, to say no, to speak up, doesn't understand how wrong the situation is. And honest to God, it was in that paper in college, 10 years after this whole thing happened, that I wrote for the first time that maybe this wasn't an equal partnership and that what Andy was doing was, I, I think maybe it was wrong. And so previously I had written about how I was hurt, I was upset, I felt left behind, I felt lonely, all these things, but I, it wasn't that it was wrong. I didn't even understand it was wrong until I was 26, 27, and uh, I wrote it in this paper and turned it in. I really didn't think it was that much of a revelation, but the, I mean, the professor called me on my phone and asked me to come in, and she she said, "Have you you've seriously never talked to anyone? Do you, do you know how wrong this is?" And um, so she referred me to speak to the counseling center at Cornell, and I let her know that I did go to the counseling center, but I never told the counselor. I mean, I didn't talk about it again for a couple of years. So that was the first time I said something, which I think is really important to note that I didn't even understand how wrong it was. I didn't understand it was illegal. I didn't understand it was a crime. I didn't understand my inability to end it until it was after the time when legal action could be taken against Andy. Um, in Two thousand nine, I guess. I in two thousand nine, I decided I wanted to tell my family, which I knew would 
be a hard thing because my dad was Andy's doctor and Andy came over to the house to take piano lessons from my mom. I wrote I drove home from, I was living in Harlem in New York City and I drove home to Saratoga Springs. I didn't even get my things out of the car. I was having dinner with my parents and I read a letter to them that I had written because I knew I wouldn't be able to say what I needed to say. And I was nervous that my parents wouldn't believe me, that my parents would kick me out, that I would get back in my car with my bags unpacked. but that wasn't the reaction I got. So I didn't even tell my parents until 13 years after it all happened. And the reaction from your parents? Hmm. I think it took, I think it, The closer someone is to me, I think the longer it takes them to process and understand and realize what happened and the severity of it. I think it's took me some time to realize it and it took my parents a long time it took my siblings um there's a lot of questions of how did this happen and why did it happen and whose fault is it and how did this happen and how did this happen um but And that just takes a lot of time to work through, I guess. Even before I shared this with anyone, I would say that the person who helped me process and dissect and reconstruct productively the whole experience and not in terms of the events that happened, but the internal and emotional aspects of it is far and away my youngest sister, Colleen, who, much like myself, took that dreaded course at Williams College in women's studies and ended up being a women's and gender studies major. Um, But she, Colleen, is so insightful about whatever she's listening to. And so before I even told her this, just conversations we would have together really helped me to parse it out. Um, And since I've come forward with the story, she's been the person I would credit most to my being able to speak about it and to be able to not just speak of the events, but to articulate um, the social emotional destruction with it. And did you, is everybody okay by the way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I grab a sip of water? Yeah. How are your arms over there? Good. Good? Okay. How are you doing, Brady? Wonderful. Yeah. Good. I feel like I'm just getting on tangents though, so reel me back no, if no, I get no. off. The next two ten minutes it's you've been amazing. Yeah, and you can ask me anything, so. Yeah. Um, Is this pocket weird? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true that. I'm just going to turn up the angle just for a second and catch your breath. And I'll just give you the lead on the next question. I just want you to get into what happened. I'll tell you when, not yet. Mm-hmm. What happened when you actually spoke out publicly? Mm. Um, and if there were any legal mm. consequences? Yeah, but you can talk about your other effing the student language frustration. Because mm. mm. it is so common. Yeah. Whether it's college, whether it's. That's what I. It, 
it's just been crazy for me to realize how common it is. Yeah. The more some of us realize it, I mean, how is someone allowed to publicly state that he does this to women and Oh, I'd be glad to. <laughs> Welcome the opportunity. Did he go to the bathroom or anything? No. Nope. Okay. He would have turned off the sound by then. <laughs> oh. Of course. Good. Okay, so do you remember? What I um, yeah, so basically. When I came forward publicly. Yeah. So tell me how you did that and what, if there were any. Mm hmm. I skated through 2006, and I missed that Olympic team. I stopped skating, and that's when I went to Cornell, graduated from Cornell, moved to New York City, and got the bug to go back to skating. A lot of people asked me if I left skating because I was sexually abused by someone within the sport, if that's originally why I left. Did I return to skating? because I wanted revenge of this? And the answer to both is no. I, the, in the seven years I was away from the rink, I was able to tell the people that I needed to tell that this happened. Those people being my family, those people being the, my, my skating family as well, you could say. So I told my coach and I told the athletes that I remained friends with who I am best friends with today. And I told the people that I needed to tell that this happened and overwhelmingly and exclusively their reaction was A, not surprise, which is pretty interesting, and B, empathy and support for me. So I felt as if I could go back into a skating rink without this huge burden and secret and almost as if I'm skating with a parachute behind me, you know? Um, so anyway, so I, I felt much freer when I went back to skating in 2013. And honest to God, this is how it happened. I raced a marathon on skates, not running. I raced a skating marathon and I did quite well. And a reporter from the Milwaukee NPR station, Mitch Tyke started asking me questions and we just kind of chatted a bit and he, he proposed that we do an online, or excuse me, he proposed that we do a, a radio blog of sorts. So a weekly on the radio leading up to the Olympic trials, what it's like to be old in a sport at 30 and coming back and having to have a full-time job while skate, just all those questions, right? And in that time period, I agreed to it, and we had a scheduled uh, the first interview in the station. I trusted the guy, and I called some of the top lawyers that are involved with combating sexual abuse in the Olympic movement and was told, no way, do not do, not do this. You are going to be sued for defamation of character. Um, it's going to be too much of a distraction to your skating. You're going to be sued. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then I called another lawyer. His name is John Little. And he said, quote, unquote, fuck it. Let's do it. And so when I called John and he said, let's do it. And I said, okay, well, if I'm sued on Monday morning, he's like, I'll be there. Tell me where and I'll be there. So with that, I went on to Milwaukee Public Radio and um, for the first time ever publicly told my story and disclosed how Andy Gable, the former president of U.S. Speed Skating, four-time Olympian, Olympic silver medalist, 76 international skating medals, 
chairman of the International Skating Union. Uh, he ran SLOC for the 2002 Olympics, buddy buddy with Mitt Romney, sexually molested me for months and months and months when I was a kid. And it was the weekend of the America Cup competition in Salt Lake City. And I was on the ice when the story broke. And I remember, so a long track oval is similar to a, a running, it is the same as a running track. And on the inside of a long track oval are two short track hockey rinks. And the sp short track team was skating on one of them. And I'm skating on the big oval. And I remember just on, on the, the short track rink has pads. If you think of Apollo Ono and everybody falling into the walls, we have pads on the walls just like boom, 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 all these laptops opening and just seeing my picture on every single lap. And I mean, I have goosebumps when I say it. Every time I came around, it was just another laptop and people, people just stopped skating and were just looking at me as I went around, you know? Um, and I did not know what... My, I mean, at the time I thought I didn't know what my day would be like. In hindsight, I didn't know what my life would be like after disclosing such a story. And I got off the ice and no one has ever questioned me. No one has doubted me. People apologized to me for being training partners when this was going on and not stepping up. Um, people, I mean, it was just utter um, empathy and admiration that I felt and not being ostracized and excommunicated, as I feared. Um, and then the next day was the uh, first day of racing. And my uh, we had set up a bit of a, a team for when this was going to break in case it was a big story. And um, one of those people, his name is Michelle, and she was in Virginia. She was watching, tracking what, if it was picked up by any news stories, and it was picked up, I mean, globally. It was um, on the UK's Daily Mail, first across the US, so ESPN, Sports Illustrated, New York Times, USA Today, I mean, the whole gamut. It was in um, newspapers in China and Hungary, and I mean, world over, it was, um, I guess, for a stage, we stopped hearing from Michelle. And we're like, hey, is, is the story dead? Is it done? And she's like, no, I'm stuck in Pop Sugar. Everyone's talking about your name and what kind of name you have. Um, so, I mean, it, it kind of, it, it was a, a big story. Um, I was able to compete through that weekend. I set personal bests in every single race. And I think when something so traumatic happens to you, you learn to compartmentalize very, very well. And so it was today I will tell all and then I'll put it in a box and put it on the shelf and focus on skating. Um, I, my, my workout jacket and warm up jacket said BridieFarrell.com on the back of it. So there was really no question as to who Bridie Farrell was. And I was watching the races and I heard a group of women behind me literally say, that's her. And it was like a just a punch to the gut. I was like, wow. And me being me, I turned around and I was like, hi, I'm Bridie Farrell. And it was a bunch of girls from the Canadian team. And they were just, I mean, they're like, you're our hero. How did you do this? Um, and I think that 
when I decided to speak up publicly, it gave me a new set of wings and confidence in that um, instead of hearing them say, that's her, and just kind of putting my head down and, and going off to face it, and I think it was a really, really, really important lesson um, because they weren't uh, negatively whispering behind my back. They were themselves unable to be vulnerable enough to talk about it because one in four girls are sexually abused. So either one of the six of them has been or they certainly know someone. Um, and so it really, really cracked open the idea that possibly this stuff that only was taking, the sexual abuse that was only taking place in the Catholic Church or in our all boys schools was actually permutating the pure and beautiful and untouchable Olympic movement. And um, that's the reality of it. And uh, the conversation had started but I, I came out swinging and, um, and swinging in truth, basically. I spoke with, what's his name? It'll come to me, but I spoke with the uh, head of the Olympic Committee and I said, you gotta fix this. Like, this is on you. This is under your purview. And um, I have been very, very let down and disappointed by the lack of substantial action by the Olympic Committee, by U.S. Speed Skating, um, by these organizations. And... It's the Olympic Committee has something called Safe Sport, which is a training program to recognize when a coach or a teammate is grooming athletes, but it's statistically most people who are being sexually abused don't disclose at the time. The average age of a woman to disclose is age 42, right? So unless you're superhuman Dara Torres and you're still competing, then most of these athletes are out of competition, right? And what you have are athletes that are post-competition who grow up into adults and super strong women, and then they report it. And so the Olympic Committee, schools, society needs ways to address known pedophiles living among us when someone discloses years later. And I said this to Malia Arlington, who's the head of the Safe Sport, and she said to me, looked me in the eye, she said, well, no one has called in and said that they, you know, no one has called in with a retroactive case. And I was like, okay, well, Malia, I'm Bridie Farrell, and I was molested by Andy Gable when I was 15. There it is, what are you gonna do? There's nothing that the Olympic Committee has done to keep Andy Gable from coaching a swim team, coaching a soccer team, anything. After some serious uproar and um, serious, serious, serious pressure and perseverance from volunteers within speed skating, um, a petition within speed skating came together and finally Andy's uh, membership was taken away from being part of U.S. Speed Skating. Um, they have a policy of once an Olympian, then you're a lifetime member of U.S. Speed Skating. And if you're a member of U.S. Speed Skating, you can then go forward and get a uh, certification to coach. And I was like, seriously? You guys can't even take action to do that. So after about a two-year fight, they did U.S. Speed Skating took away Andy's membership. Um, he's still a lifetime member of the Hall of Fame. And the Olympic Committee doesn't have a central system or way of keeping a sexually abusive speed skater from mingling with the judo team. And the taekwondo coach 
who's known to have select, uh, sexually abused athletes can easily go over to the wrestling team, right? So there's there's a, a huge lack of accountability that they're willing to take. And it's interesting to note how how hard the Olympic Committee will go after, I don't know, early 20-year-olds using drugs to get better in sports. I mean, the amount of money that the doping agencies put into that, USADA, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, the amount that they tracked down Lance Armstrong, went after him, right? Why can't they do a tenth of that for grown men molesting young girls? Well, what happened legally? Did you ever try to go through the court system? Did, can you tell me about the New York statute of limitations? Because it was in New York, is that yeah. under that? Yeah. <laughs> so I, the big, the big concern when I was going to speak publicly about being molested 15 years ago is I have no legal recourse nor legal protection. So in New York State, where uh, the majority of the abuse took place, the statute of limitations is five years. That means at age 18, you have five years to contact the police so that criminal investigations can happen and or civil suit can be um, processed. Well, when I spoke, it was 15 years later, it was well past the statute. So an individual like myself, I, you can't just come forward and say, this guy did this, if it's not true, because then he sues back for defamation of character, right? So that was the concern, is that I would say Andy Gable molested me, and Andy would say, no, I didn't, and sue me back, which I have evidence that he did and proof that he did, so that negates that situation, right? Mind you, Andy admitted that he did and apologized publicly through the Chicago Tribune, which is another point that we have known predators on the street. We have Andy Gable who acknowledges to Phil Hirsch in the Chicago Tribune that he had an inappropriate relationship with young girls. We have Donald Trump that acknowledges that he has the power to do whatever he wants to women, right? So we know these people are out there and they're admitting it. Now, as far as what we can do, nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's no registry. There is no criminal action. There's no civil action. So my huge, huge focus has been to change the statute of limitations in New York State. Why New York State? Because that's where it happened to me, but also New York State is a, a, a tough state, and if we can pass laws here, it'll trickle across. So what I wanna do is be able to ultimately eliminate the statute of limitations, but at least lift it. Lift it much higher. The average reporting age, disclosing age is 42, so lift it past there, right? as well as, and this is where the debate is really happening within the New York State Legislature, is that there must be at least a one-year window that allows victims like myself to change that from being a victim to a true survivor by calling out my abuser. And so it would permit a one-year retroactive time period where anyone whose statute has expired to come forward and press civil charges. If we knew that this, this person over here was robbing a bank, and we knew it, and we could point him out, we could point him out, we, the police would go and get him, right? Well, we know that these X, Y, and Z men are abusing boys and girls. So why are we not going to get them? is the question. And I understand that there is purpose to statute limitations. And when the statute was first placed on laws at, laws at large, it was just a one blanket thing. But the way that the way the society is today, like it just keeps, you know, keeps bulking up these laws. And so my goal is to sit down and I am not, I don't want to tell members of the New York State legislator, why I think it should change. I'm interested in hearing 
why they don't think it should change. And so, again, to turn to the human aspect of this and to peel away, I mean, it's like an ear of corn or an onion or something, that there's so many layers to this, to how do we together fix this problem? And I, for the life of me, I don't see it as a controversial question. I mean, adult men should not sexually abuse children. Okay, we all agree on that. So let's make laws that enforce that. And um, I just wish that, I mean, I guess this is the game of politics, but I just wish that both parties could come to the table and leave the red and, bl- red and blue ties at the door along with their egos and then have just humans sit down at the table together and try and address this problem. So, I mean, I don't know if something coming from you will break the wall of ignorance, but can you tell me, can you go back in your head and think about that 15-year-old girl and what the horror you felt, like psychologically, metaphorically, color-wise, emotion-wise, what it feels like to be violated for someone who might not know? There's a lot about the time period of when I was being molested that is blotchy and the memories come back over time. I remember when it all ended and Andy went to the Nagano Olympics. I remember feeling so alone, just so alone. And I remember crying into my pillow, but like crying from like a visceral of just pain. And I had just got my license to give a perspective of how off the situation was. And I remember driving to a store and buying a journal and writing in it that I've been told if you need to say something and you don't have anybody to talk to, you should write it down. And that's kind of how I started going about it. I indirectly tried to tell people, I passively tried to tell people. In the 10th grade, I wrote a poem about feeling alone, about just being in pain. Um, And then I think that uh, for many years, I was able to just block it out. Um, And I think that the, the pain and the impact kind of the more I pushed it down when I was 16 and 17 and 18, 19, 20, the higher it pushed back. Um, And the emotion or the adjective I use to describe um, when huge bouts of depression come on is that I feel like styrofoam. I mean, that is the only way I can describe what I feel like. And I think that it's a function of both, I mean, what, what the hell is styrofoam, right? It's, there's nothing to it. There's nothing redeemable about it. It's not f- from nature. It's not pleasant. It's not, I mean, people are trying to ban it, right? Like there's nothing in it. It never goes away. You put it in a waste yard, dump yard, and it, it doesn't biodegrade, it doesn't go back to the earth, it doesn't become part of the universe again. And so I just feel like this 
styrofoam that you can't, I mean, when you touch styrofoam, it gives you the chills. It can make a weird noise. I mean, everything about it, but that is the only, and I mean, I've been in and out of depression enough that I've tried to think of a different, and it's just styrofoam is the way I would describe it. That and just living in a, a, a fog of loneliness. Right? Yeah, nobody, nobody likes styrofoam. Dunkin' Donuts. Nobody likes it. Said that. And and being that age and just your body changing and all of that. Well, here, so here's the thing too, being that age, so upper adolescence, right, and your body changing and developing over time. Okay. I was a athlete, right? So I'm training. I did not look, I mean, I'm 34 now. I'm not sure how old I even look now. There was nothing. I do not, I consciously cannot understand how a 33-year-old man would be attracted to a 15-year-old girl with the body that I had. I mean, there was nothing womanly about me. So just from a looks perspective, I don't understand that. And I'm 34 now, so the age that Andy was, with all due respect, I have no desire to hang out with a 15-year-old girl. Like, I don't even understand how that happens. Like, where? Like, I mean, there's just something, the, the synapse there is, is somehow off in terms of, I remember listening to his music, and I remember listening to my music, which is, like, teeny boppy music. I have no, so it's just a bizarre I don't, I don't get it. And um, did you have any sense at any time from anyone or just from society in general about the blaming the victim syndrome, maybe because you didn't speak up? Or? Yeah, so there is a stigma associated with blaming the victim. And I think that is less true then one fears it to be true or we talk about. Um, I think the person that blames the victim the most is the victim. But as a society, I think that there is starting to, starting to be a shift away from what was she wearing? Um, how much did she drink? But I'd be lying if it didn't exist. So for example, I knew I was gonna be on camera today. Last night, I went to get my nails done with my friend like we do every week. And I literally thought, what color red can I have that's not too provocative? I don't want the person on the other side of the camera to say, well, look at her. I mean, of course, right? And that's, that's really, really bad. And then when I had this conversation with my friend Pam, she's like, oh, sh that's true. We have to account for that. You know, like what kind of world are we living in where you have to still think about that, that is someone gonna believe what I'm saying if I mean, frequently I wear kind of obnoxious red lipstick. It was like, no, 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 we can't wear that tomorrow, right? But who, so anyway, the whole victim blaming thing. I think that um, this, this past Christmas I was home uh, for a funeral of a high school friend and another high school friend came up to me and he, he said he just didn't, he, he read about me in the paper, and he just didn't understand it. He didn't understand. He said, well, why didn't you just walk away? He's like, if some old guy put his hands down my pants, I would just walk away. And so I think that slowly we are starting to see in society that the daily life of a female is different than the daily life of an equivalent male. And that the the power dynamic that exists, the stigma that exists, the, I mean, it goes on and on, but it's 
So I think the idea of the blaming the victim, the more of us that come forward and share our story, the more others are going to come f come forward and share their story. And then it's it's going to be where people are going to see that it it isn't you know the the girl's fault. And I think Joe Biden, President Biden is doing an amazing Vice President Biden is doing an amazing service with It's On Us campaign and that this whole no means no is, that's done. We're, we're like, we're done. Yes means yes. And, and that's it. Um, so it's, it's, there's a long way to go um, when someone like myself who people look up to as someone that has overcome this and is a strong woman, et cetera, and I still think about what color nail polish I'm going to wear on camera. Does anybody else have any questions for Lynn Brady? Well, if they're all women, they're all have their ears open. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to ask, anything you can relate to? Okay. When I stopped skating after the 2014 Olympic trials, um, I, I said, um, we're supposed to call that. When I stopped skating after the 2014 Olympic trials, I came back to Brooklyn with my dog Lexington. I was previously working in finance and I decided to shift my direction from working for a major for firm to developing my own brand, which is Bicycle Fish Financial and Insurance Solutions, which I target young, well, I wouldn't say just young people, people like, I wanna work with people like myself that are open-minded and forward-thinking, um, and that's kind of the purpose of it in an all-inclusive way, especially including women and bringing women to the table to discuss their financial goals and situation. I wish I could say that I skate now. I wish that there was a better place to speed skate in New York City. One day there will be. But right now, I, um, because of skating and various reasons, I've had a lot of injuries and surgeries, and I find myself doing physical rehab more than actually exercising. Um, but I don't know if I'm answering this question very well at all. Uh, so I, I don't skate at this time. I'm not coaching at this time. Uh, but I, I definitely hope to remain somehow involved in the sport. Very good. And my last question was going to be, I think you've answered it already, a, a positive message forward for the future. Um, and you've talked about how more and more people were speaking up. And I think one of the most poignant things you said was speaking out actually gave you wings. I can see that for you visually <laughs> on the ice. Mm -hmm. like it made you stronger. Is there anything else you want to add to that for a positive message forward and hope for the future? Yeah. One of, one of the books I read before I told my family, before I spoke out publicly, was a book about Theo Fleury, who is a Canadian-born NHL hockey player. He played for the Colorado Avs for a bit. And he, among many Canadian boys, were molested by uh, the same coach. And his book ends with, you're not alone. You don't need to suffer this in silence. If it's happening to you, call someone. And I really had never thought about reaching out to people that this is something that happened to me, this is something I let happen to me, I participated in this, and it's my cross the bear, right? But Theo Fleury's book changed that. And, it, and I read the whole 300 pages for the last line, which was to call someone. And so I came forward not to shame the man who molested me, 
not to shame Andy, not to shame sports, but to help the kids that are in it today, the young kids that are in it today was my initial and primary motivation. And to those kids, I say, if it's happening to you, and by it, I mean, if you have, if someone makes you keep a secret and not a special surprise, as in we're baking a cake for the birthday birthday party, but I bring you to my house and I play games with you in secret ways that nobody else does. If someone is doing something to you, to tell your parents, to tell your friend's parents, to tell someone else. And if you keep talking and you keep telling people and no one believes you, to call me. You can go to brideyfarrell.com and call me. And the more people that speak out, the, the more it's going to change. But as I've spoken out, I've realized that it's not, we cannot put it on the, the shoulders of 10 to 18-year-old girls in sports. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's, it's on us. And so to anyone else that ex- has experienced what I've experienced, um, to share your story however you're ready to. And that could be, for the first time, buying a journal and writing about it. Your father that raped you, he might be dead. Your uncle that brought you behind the barn, he might be in prison. You might still have to have Thanksgiving dinner with your brother. But get your story out for yourself. If you want to share your story, find find the community and the group to do that. And as cliche as I always thought it sounded, it is the more people that contacted me and told me their story, which allowed me to realize that I'm not alone, was life-changing. I mean, I felt alone, alone for 15, 18 years. And then I came forward with my story fearful that it would push me farther from people. But I have family members who told me about other family members that exposed themselves. I have family members that were raped in their own home when their parents were upstairs. I have best friends. And it goes on and on. And quite frankly, whomever's listening to this knows someone as well. And so I think that um, the more we come together, the, the more we can address this, much like the breast cancer movement. I mean, it's become its own industry, right? That it used to be that if, if your mom didn't come to Thanksgiving dinner, she's just not feeling well. And that's that, right? No, mom can come to dinner with a bald head from chemo and good on you, mom, you're going through breast cancer and you're still coming out, right? It's out of the closet. It's out of the darkness. And that's what we need to do. It's not a pleasant conversation, but it's a real conversation. And real life is what is, it's all about. Um, the other thing that I really want to stress is that it is not a, we are not going to change this problem by enforcing, by, by getting the girls soccer team, the girls speed skating team, the girls volleyball team down and saying, listen, ladies, one in four of you are going to have something unfortunate happen to you. We have designated a safe person for you to go and tell. Okay, that's not the solution. The solution is to have the boys soccer team, the boys speed skating team, and the boys volleyball team down and say, listen, we're all humans. Don't violate another human. Respect each other. It's how are we raising our men and boys in a culture that this is acceptable. And that's, that's, that's the ultimate cultural shift that needs to happen. It's not 
creating a safe sport manual of how to recognize a perpetrator. It's creating a manual of how to treat and love and respect another human being, which goes back to how I want to change the law and not a law of Republicans and Democrats or this or that, but a law of human respect. And uh, I think that is something that we really, really need to address is how are we raising our men and boys where this is an acceptable um, way to behave. And Jackson Katz is the, the person that nails that discussion the best. Zone in, zone out. <laughs> um, we're just gonna get some some B roll um, of her face. Can you give us a look? Yeah. So just stare at me and try not to laugh at my clown face. Mm. Sure. Get out of there, she says. In the meantime, I'm just gonna go over my notes for you. Okay. Skipped anything? I don't think so. I think you did an amazing job. How do you feel? Good. Awkward? No. no, totally normal. In a silent room, seven people staring at me. Yeah. Hello, Gamma. Oh. Uh, and you can uh, you can relax now. I don't know how you are. 